guys and welcome to my channel Adisa Talks. I'm Adisa and um, today I'm actually going to start a series. A series that's probably going to talk about each chapter of a sensor, a molecular sensor book that I'm actually studying for my PhD program. So today I'm going to start with the introduction about the molecular sensors. But before we start, how about I tell you guys a little bit about myself. Um, the reason why I got interested into this topic of neurotransmitter is just through research. I was really interested in Parkinson's disease and how different neurotransmitters are affected in the brain. How maybe the increase in some or the deficiency in some can actually affect you know different brain regions and actually make us sick. So why not create an amazing sensor that is micro size or nano size that's able to maybe get implemented in the brain to actually monitor the different concentration of neurotransmitters in the brain. For my purpose and for my research, I'm actually interested in dopamine as a neurotransmitter. So this book is actually going to help me to visualize and learn about the different methods and the different techniques that I could use in my research um, in order to come up with an amazing sensor. So stay tuned. So the first chapter is the introduction to molecular sensors. And a sensor is actually a device that's able to detect, monitor, and maybe measure different physical properties. And the elements that are actually associated with molecular sensor are one, being able to capture and recognize a specific element, molecule, ion, or protein. Two, the sensor is actually going to be able to transduce the electrical signals produced by the changes in charges when the detection of these specific ions are detected. And three, we're actually gonna be able to measure and analyze these signals that we do get from these sensor for data processing. So some of the examples of molecular sensors that do exist are carbon sensors, gas sensors, even oxygen sensors. But in the book, the two examples that they give are the olfactory system, which actually behaves as a sensor, as well as the immunosensor field effect transistor molecular sensor. So the olfactory system is actually a system that we possess in our nose. So imagine you're given a bouquet of flowers and you're smelling the roses or you're smelling the flowers or the tulips. And you're able to detect or able to tell if the flowers smell good, if they're dry, if they don't smell good, or if you don't like them at all. And so what happens is the molecules that are projected by the flowers actually bind to the olfactory receptors in our noses and those receptors create signals that are sent, that are transduced to the brain through the olfactory bulb. Now the second example that the book actually talks about is the immunosensor. And this sensor actually detects the changes in charges that are produced by the sensing effect when the antigen molecules bind to the antibody proteins on the gate insulator of the sensor. Cool, right? So as I spoke about in the beginning of the video, a sensor has, what, three elements. It's able to capture and recognize, it's able to transduce, and it's able to measure. Well, it also is able to do so with different mechanisms. And with the capture and recognition element of the transfer, it's able to use an antigen and antibody mechanism to do so. Well, an antigen is actually a molecule that differs in shapes and charges, while an antibody, which is actually a protein produced by our immune system, is made up of two light chains and two heavy chains that molds it into the letter Y. Now, when these two actually bind through non covalent forces, you're gonna have a change in these charges that generates the signal. And the signal is actually gonna be able to get transduced and then get measured. Now, the second mechanism that a sensor can use in order to be able to capture and recognize an element is using the DNA as a recognizing agent. 
Now you might think, okay, what am I talking about? But follow me, it's, it's pretty simple. So the second mechanism actually uses DNA sequences through a process called DNA hybridization. And DNA hybridization is actually using a single strain DNA and matching it to a different base pair in order to make a hybridized DNA sequence. And this hybridized DNA sequence actually generate different electrical signals or signals that get picked up and get transduced in order to be able to determine the specific strand of DNA that we have and be able to identify it and use that as a diagnosis for viruses or diseases. How cool is that? So the third mechanism that a sensor can use to be able to capture and recognize an element are called aptamers. And aptamers are actually easily modified and synthesized nucleic acid that have a high affinity and a high specificity to different proteins, different drugs that could be used as a diagnosis tool. But in order to select the specific aptamers for a specific target protein, the aptamers go through a process called a systematic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment. Super long, but I was able to get it for you guys. So during this process, what happens is you have aptamers that are actually going to bind to protein targets. And through a series of washes, and bounded aptamers to protein are actually washed out and bounded aptamers to proteins are amplified using PCR. And from there, based on the electrical signal or the signal that's generated, it can get transduced and it could be used to determine the specific protein that the aptamers are bounded to. So, the second element of a molecular sensor is what? Its ability to transduce a signal. So just like a molecular sensor has different mechanisms in order to be able to capture and recognize an element, protein, and ion, it actually has about three different transduction mechanisms. So with an electrical transduction, the signals are actually obtained through impedance, which is just determining the resistance. They're obtained through voltammetry, which is determining the current based on the range of potential. And they're also determined through calimetric, which is actually determining the different charges and measuring the different charges generating. Now, during your mechanical transduction, the signals are actually obtained through piezoresistive measurements. And the piezoresistive measurements is actually measurements depending on the different mechanical stress, strain, temperature, that is being applied onto the sample. But last but not least, the third mechanism is optical transduction. And through this mechanism, transduced signal can be obtained through fluorescence and absorption of different molecules. So when we are talking about a system, essentially a system that has to capture, recognize, transduce, and measure, there are different factors that we need to take into account, especially a system that acts as a transducer. And the factors that we need to take into account are the responsivity of the transductor, the sensitivity of the transductor, as well as the noise that is generated. So the responsivity of a transductor is actually defined as the ratio between the input signal and the output signal. While the noise of the system is actually expressed through the power density function, which is basically the power of the noise in the signal as a function of frequency. But most importantly, we want our system to be able to be sensitive to the different proteins that it's detecting. So sensitivity is actually a very big factor that we need to look at because we want a system to be able to be sensitive to the specific proteins that it's supposed to detect. So the definition of sensitivity is the minimal level of the output signal with respect to noise. Now, after looking at these different factors that can impact the transducer as well as its sensitivity and the noise of the system, we need to look at the performance of a molecular sensor. And some of the characteristics that we do look at when talking about the performance is 
the dynamic range, the sensitivity, the response time, the lifetime, as well as the specificity. Now, these requirements are pretty simple to think about. Think about it. We want our sensor to be able to be sensitive to a specific protein. If I want to be able to detect dopamine in the brain, I have to make sure that my sensor is able to do so. Now, in terms of response time, you don't want to put a sensor into a sample, into the brain, and it taking five hours to determine the concentration of that specific neurotransmitter. So you want the response time to be fast. The sensor should be able to determine the different concentration or the measurement needed when placed into a sample. So in terms of sensitivity, we want the sensor to be able to be sensitive to a specific protein regardless of the different interferences. So for example, if I'm to put a sensor into my brain and trying to detect the concentration of dopamine, there are serotonin as a neurotransmitter, there are uric acid, ascorbic acid as well. So our sensor should be able to detect the specific concentration of that specific neurotransmitter regardless of the interferences that it has. Now, when talking about specificity, the sensor should be specific to specific molecules. Therefore, if I have a sensor that's supposed to detect dopamine, I should not have any signals detecting the serotonin neurotransmitter. Get it? Now, a dynamic range for the neurotransmitters should actually match real life ranges of the different concentration of that specific molecule, ion, or neurotransmitter in the brain. So don't design a sensor that can only measure one molecule when you have a billion molecules in the body. It should be able to be efficient enough to determine the specific concentration or ranges of concentration of that specific ion in a sample. Now, last but not least, we want our sensor to last long. Especially in the medical community, we do not want to open up a person's body over and over again. Who wants that? At least I don't. So we want our sensor to be able to get implanted for a long period of time and be able to resist the different interferences while measuring the specific concentration of the protein, ions, or neurotransmitter in the brain. Now, at the beginning of the chapter, I actually spoke about the olfactory system. A cool thing that this book actually talks about is using animals as molecular sensors. So, animals can be used as molecular sensors because they actually have more receptors, about 220 million receptors, in their nostrils that allow them to detect a specific molecules. So animals are actually being trained to do so, to actually replace our, our, our technologies because they're cheaper and they're more efficient. So an example of using animals as molecular sensors are using canine or dogs to detect specific drugs such as cocaine. There are also bees that are actually being used for the detection of land miles. Could you imagine? I never thought about that. And last but not least, rats are actually being used to detect land miles as well as tuberculosis in different samples. So I hope you guys learned a little bit more about molecular sensors, the different elements, and the different mechanisms that actually are entailed into capturing, into transducing, and into measuring these signals of the feedback. I hope I was able to help. Please leave all your questions below so I'll get to them as soon as I can. If you have any requests or any books that you want me to review or talk about or go over, please leave them down.